Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Mage Errant, Book 6, Tongue Eater, Chapters 40 through 43, Descending Mist, Unsolved Mysteries and Unwanted Messages, The Layered Sky, and Bromeliad Life. In these chapters, we get another check-in with a Lustin who believes that he is receiving maybe a request to meet up from Valia, which I really want, also don't want, to be true. And our friends wind up in a new world yet again and get ready to settle in for a while. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Dan for commissioning this episode. Thank you for being here, Dan, as well. Appreciate you. Um, so I just wanted to, off the top, I have just started a new medication and I am having some really, really intense dry mouth. So forgive me if I have to stop and like take a sip of water here and there, but it has been parched. Uh, we'll see if it's worth it. You know how that can be. It's like the side effects may be worse than what I was dealing with originally. Um, but these chapters, so this is what I'm going to say here overall is my main emotion by the time we got to this, the end of this group of chapters was relief that we are going to be ending the exploration for a while. And uh, it's not because I don't enjoy that aspect of it, but really by the time we get to like the first several pages of Bromeliad life, I'm like, I feel like I'm just sort of reading a tour guide. You know, it just felt like we have been with our friends for chapters and chapters now with kind of a lot less like fun dialogue, a lot less examining our feelings or talking things through. It's been so much just travel describing things we're seeing. And it's the kind of thing that I think if it were, if this were like a compendium that you got as a guide alongside everything, then 100%. I feel like I started to tune it out. Um, and that's always sort of my litmus test for me is especially when I'm listening to, to the audiobook. If there comes a point where I have to rewind because I realized that I completely zoned out and missed it once that can happen. You can just get distracted twice. You might be having a bad day. It might be the narrator three times, that's when it starts to be like, all right, maybe this is just not gripping me particularly. And I really found myself getting low key bored, which is a shame because he has clearly put a lot of thought into what these worlds look like. But I just found myself kind of being like, I right, can we just get to it already? It's a lot. So and especially like, you know, I thought that there was going to be some kind of, as y'all know, big reveal about why everybody was treating them in a specific way. And it turns out that it is sort of what I wound up suspecting, that it's like more the fact that they are from somewhere else, can't speak the language. Everybody sees them as like lost souls from the underworld. And because there wound up being no real con conflict from that. It, I, I felt like I had gotten hype for something that I thought was going to be more of a problem and it just slides on by. So we get that conflict with the attacking army, but it that just didn't really, I was not 
feeling any tension from that because I never sensed for a moment that our friends were really in danger from it. It felt like, let me get them into a battle so that you guys can see what their armor can do and you can get a sense of who they would be up against and that even though this armor is paper, it's nothing to fuck with. It felt almost the same as walking through a city and describing what we're seeing, except we're doing it with a battle. We're describing what their weapons can do. We're describing what their attacks can do. We are describing what their magic can do. And so I, I'm just hopeful that now we have gotten this spot, we're going to stay here and actually get some more like character growth and conversations because that's my jam. That's what I'm here for. Um, Dan says this book is a little like a Rocky training montage needed at the main crew to get a lot needed. I think for the main crew to get a lot done to prep for the final book. Yeah. And I feel like, um, I, I just feel like we could have spent less time there now, you know, keep in mind I'm unspoiled. It may be that once I get further on, I'm going to look back and be like, oh, I see why he was like going into so much detail and setting up so many things here. But from where I'm sitting right now, it just feels like John Beers was having a good, a good time creating worlds and couldn't resist overloading us with detail when it wasn't actually necessary. That's where I'm at now. And I may change my mind, but I feel like it's, you know, fair to make that judgment at this time. Um, so our friends, I had thought that they were going to like get to see the whole thing with the caterpillars, uh, with Mul Mount Mulberry, but they never actually go in there. There's just like the sound of chewing and Godric saying he smells caterpillars, but no, uh, no exploring of the area. Um, and they, it says it was the one labyrinth was buried within the depths of the mountain accessible from the forested valley and it was remarkably similar to the labyrinths they'd traversed so far the other two were the strangest labyrinths they'd encountered yet the first near the top of the highest peak of mount mulberry well above the tree line and snow line was more obviously artificial than most labyrinths resembling a ruined city according to galvacrin when you tried to examine it though your eyes quickly lost track of the flow of the city and you'd find yourself completely incapable of interpreting what you were seeing Galvacrin claimed that it was similar to the way victims of strokes perceived the world, though he didn't explain what caused the effect. And that's a really fascinating, like, tying in what happens, magically speaking, with an actual disorder that can happen in your brain. Because these are, this is a, you know, brains, it's really remarkable when you look into what things can go wrong how little it can take to completely flip somebody's world, not even flip it. When I say flip it upside down, that makes it sound like, well, you know, then you just navigate it upside down. It's the same thing. It's more like uh, you take somebody's perception of the world, you chop it into like 20,000 pieces, you put it in a box and shake it up, and then you dump it back into their brain. And they're supposed to like make sense of all of these disparate images and vague memories of like words and meanings that don't attach to anything. And, uh, there's some book, I think it was called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And it was about a man who had a, uh, like, the memory in his mind, it connected the wrong words to the wrong objects. So he was like, it, it was just like constant battling to remember what something actually was and what you actually called it. And I've just... That sounds so scary. The idea of being that completely out of control of your own mind is really humbling because I think all of us have a sort of sense that at least we are in control in some ways, you know, even if you have mental illness, if you have depression like I do and your brain can feel like your enemy, there are at least things where you're like, well, but this particular train of thought does follow a type of logic once you can't even rely on that anymore, I'm 
that's just sort of the idea of having to depend entirely potentially on somebody else helping you to like navigate it all. That's a lot. Um, so once you enter it, it supposedly like wears off and you're able to get through it. Um, the third labyrinth was one of the more common types. It was a mist form labyrinth with shifting paths in a disorienting fog bank. Wandering off the path could strand you in a random world if you ever escaped at all. And they are like going in there with Mackerel, who, because this thing moves a lot, he can help them to a point, but he can't do as much as he normally can where he just like shows them the way because the way changes every moment. Um, and Galvacrin, it turns out, is like, I don't know what you're going to get when you go up to this labyrinth. Like, it's anybody's guess. Um, so, let's see, I'm trying to find the spot. Uh, Galvacrin had provided a table charting the complex peregrinations of the misformed labyrinth in question, but they hadn't needed it at all. The labyrinth's central point was most of the way up the second highest peak of Mount Mulberry and returned there every dawn at dusk, which is such a weird, like, you know, it's an unpredictable thing, but also follows this very predictable pattern. Um, so they go and buy a bunch of supplies because they really are not sure how long they're going to like they're going to a world that is uh potentially really hostile in terms of its environment and they don't know what the people are going to be like they're not sure what their uh supplies are going to like what they're going to be able to buy or collect so they want to stock up before they head out which i think makes sense um so Let's see. I'm trying to find the spot here. Uh, oh my God, you guys, there is a, mo a moment where Sabe spots a possum and I am really enjoying this running joke a lot. This is one of those, like, reminds me of the cabbage man in Avatar The Last Airbender, which uh, if you listen to Owen and I covering that show, the first time the cabbage guy shows up and gets all of his cabbages destroyed Owen and I said something like wouldn't it be funny if the cabbage man was just somebody who always turned up in different towns like traveling with them and then that was exactly what wound up happening and we were so delighted with it um so they they are able to take a switch back most of the way up and it says they reached the fortress in mid afternoon and it should have been no surprise what they encountered bureaucracy, lots of it. Hugh and the others decided to shortcut all of it. Instead of trying to slowly work their way through a maze of bureaucracy where they didn't speak the language, the group marched up to the biggest, fanciest, most expensive looking desk in the entry hall. And I love this. This dude's wearing a hat and Hugh has to stop mackerel from going at it because he just, he still has that. He may be maturing, but his uh, antipathy to hats has not changed. Um, so he drops all of their paperwork, gestures to the mountain, makes it very clear what they're trying to do here. And I love this. Oh, no, it's sorry. It's Sabe who does it, not Hugh. Um, the important functionary tried to argue, clearly tried to gesture them toward other bureaucrats, but Sabe simply refused to move, save to occasionally tap Apchek's letter, gesturing at their group, then point upward toward the peak again. And guards try to come down. Hugh blocks them with magic. And once they do that, they start to garner a little bit more attention. And finally, this dude picks up the letter and his attitude changes completely. And this is the kind of shit that is so true about bureaucracy is like, if the people who were meant to be helpful actually read shit to begin with, they would probably see that it would take a lot less time to just assist than it does to argue with you about how they can't assist. But so much of the time, the people who are in these positions don't even bother because once they, I think that this is my perception of what's happening there. Once you pick it up and you begin to read it, now you're involved. 
And these are often people who just don't want to be like being involved is the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. So they're just staying as hands off as possible. And then if you actually get like, they let you talk or they read it all of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, yeah, we could do that. And it's like, fucking thank you. I've been through that so many times where it's just all I needed was for you to shut the fuck up and listen to my like one minute explanation anyway. Uh, so he gets up and it turns out that he's just like floating off the ground, which is assistance for his being elderly and probably having difficult with mo difficulties with mobility. Um, and eventually they get sent through like all of these different areas. There's guards, they get sent down a tunnel uh, the bureaucrat handed the certificate to Sabe, then left them with a group of soldiers. Only a few of the gates were ever open at once. There was never a straight shot between the inside of the fortress and the exit, which is smart. Um, so, <laughs> I love this. Facing the path were dozens of uh, ballisti and catapults on the wall above them, as well as a pair of paper armor suits flanking the gate they'd just exited. Both suits were closer to 50 feet than 40 in height and were carrying appropriately proportioned rune halberds, which Hugh had no doubt would have been a threat to even the most heavily enchanted fortification on Ithos. The two probably had to crouch before entering the fortress gates behind them. One of the suits of armor glanced down at their group, and Hugh waved awkwardly. It didn't respond for a moment, leaving Hugh feeling even more awkward, but finally gave him a nod of acknowledgement before turning its attention back upslope. I kind of wanted it to wave back, to be honest. But, um, so they make their hike and begin to start running into snow and ice. There, you know, a lot of what's going on on this mountain is what would be familiar for a lot of us on mountains on Earth. But the next land that they go to, the the mountains go up pretty high and there's no snow. It doesn't seem like there's any, I don't know if I would say there's no change in temperature, but the climate itself seems consistent because it's got green all the way up. Um, but yeah, they're running into like thin oxygen and uh, the like the whole journey here, I'm just thinking like, is anything, is something going to happen? Is something going to go wrong? And it doesn't, they managed to get through this. Okay. I was a little disappointed almost. I sort of wanted something, but, um, anyway, they get to the top and there's this ring around Cometrius, uh, which like when they're at the top of the mountain really looks remarkable. And Hugh is realizing that having Sphinx eyes almost makes it worse for him because it disorients him so badly, which I, I really could see how that would happen. Um, and the mist form labyrinth forms right in front of them. And this is so weird. When it changed direction and drifted straight toward them, it started to change in form. By the time it settled onto the empty shoulder of the mountain, nestling against the slope of the peak, it had filled itself with sharp angles and walls, like a mad architect's vision melting into vapor. And they wait, thinking something may come out and attack them. It does not. And then they walk in. And we start chapter 41 with, on Ketvin, I think. Um, he's the chief magistrate of the mist fort and we find out some things here. First, we, uh, you know, I already talked about what it turns out the deal is with everybody treating Hugh and his group really like with pity a lot of the time. Um, but it turns out that they have to regulate who's going in and out of these, uh, these labyrinths for a variety of reasons. So, Visitors wanting to pass through the gates were common enough. Mostly young knights, freshly gifted their battle armor, wanting to test themselves against the monsters. A few scholars, curious about the traitor Cloud, passed through as well, as did the surprisingly frequent poets, musicians, and artists suffering from fatal illnesses or life tragedy, wishing to take poison and die far above the concerns of the world below. And I was like, you know what? I could see that. You know, like going somewhere really far away that's like 
potentially so dangerous that you aren't coming out and you would never go there if you weren't already on your last legs. That's eh, worse ways to go. There was, in fact, a specific form to fill out for artists wanting to pass the Miss Fort for honorable suicide. It was usually just easier to pick the third peak, where there were no guards or bureaucracy in the way of the climb, but since that one was the shortest peak, the Traitor's Cloud peak was preferred. No one tried to climb the highest peak unless they had to. Most residents of Fetris below tried to pretend that the City of Madness didn't even exist. So, uh... That is where they're heading. City of Madness? That's crazy. Get it? No, but seriously, the the thing that I didn't really get here, because it was the shortest peak, the Trader's Cloud was preferred, I thought it was weird that they wouldn't pick the easiest one to climb. And I'm worried that I sort of... Uh, I, I feel like maybe I misunderstood just to reread this. It was usually just easy. Uh, it was usually easier just to pick the third peak where there were no guards or bureaucracy in the way of the climb. But since that one was the shortest peak, the traitor's cloud peak was preferred. Is he saying the traitor's cloud peak is the shortest peak? I'm worried that this is just phrased in a way that feels unclear. It may be that they pick the highest one. Well, no, because then he says that nobody goes to the highest one. Huh. I feel like I misunderstood this. Well, regardless, this is when we get the translation of what it says on the letter. Um, and I love that he he's like, I haven't had to fill out one of these particular forms for nine years, so I'm not really good at it. And I actually kind of screwed it up and had to start over again. Um, Lost souls came down from the mountain three times as often as they went up it and I was like word that's a lot what's that about I'm curious about that one um so then we go over to Alustin it turns out Alustin has maybe pushed his luck a little too far and I mean with the you know tongue eater for sure but mostly here what I'm talking about is he has let people know how much more he is suddenly capable of and given them a better idea of what to expect from him, which is not really what you want to be doing. And I love that he's like, I wish that I could blame a leak, but honestly, it's probably my own fault, which does make sense because he, I mean, a lesson is vain, you know, vain in like a, a way that isn't the what you usually think of when you think of that word, but I feel like it still applies. And also just in a, a purely practical sense, he got a new affinity and just wants to play with it. You know, you can call it training and I guess it is, but there's just an aspect of like wanting to see what I can do and how, how far I can push it. And because he is discovering this at the same time as he is, uh, you know, trying to handle this guerrilla war, it just, they don't, they're not super compatible with each other. He has wound up letting them know more than he would have liked. Um, and he has gotten this letter. Uh, and it says, to do to a lesson came across an identical letter from Valia. He didn't read that one either. Within a matter of days, half the desks in the Havathi Dominion bore copies of the letter. Worse, new ciphers were rolling out across the Dominion, different than any Alustin had faced so far. There's a bug in front of me. Uh, he was sure he and the other librarians errant would break them eventually, but it would cost him precious time. Time they could ill afford. The new ciphers, at least, only applied to high-level orders. The Dominion had figured out Alustin's scrying abilities had grown. Assassinating that general being flown dragon back in secret between provincial capitals had probably tipped their hand a bit too hard. So he has figured out how to do rapid copying at a distance, which you guys, every time we check in with him, the new things he's learned how to do freak me out even more. 
uh, letting him replicate documents a hundred leagues away or more onto pages right by his side. He'd been working on and off of the problem for weeks. It was one of those magic problems that couldn't be solved with a simple spell form. He knew other mages had solved the issue in the past, albeit at a distance of a few feet. In the end, his solution had been inspired by land seers who could map out entire landscapes at great distances. They usually projected the map into a basin of sand, water, or other free-flowing materials, sculpting it into the shape of the landscape being scryed. But due to the structural difference between landscapes and any material used to represent them, they'd been forced to add more flexibility into the spell form. It might cost them a small amount of accuracy, but it was easier than the spell form failing entirely due to sympathetic material mismatches. Alustin had taken that as inspiration, allowing some inaccuracy in his copies to prevent the spell from failing entirely. He handed them off to Emmonson, who for all their frequent bickering was a more than competent second, and then he turns his attention to Valia's letter. Letters plural. Um... Alustin, I misjudged you. I spent years thinking you had just been deluded by a monster playing off your anger and your desire for revenge, that you were still the same boy I attended every Blossom Festival with, whom I shared so many memories with. I was wrong, though. You're a monster, cast in Candoran's own image. I don't hate you. Fear you? Yes. But not hate. You've been twisted inside until all you can do is lash out. I wish it wasn't true. I wish we were walking down the streets of Helico together again. I wish both our hands weren't covered in blood. I wish neither of us was broken. And now you're walking straight down Candoran's path, seeking the death of a city in revenge for the death of our home. If I'm to be honest, I think your odds of success are slim, even with the weapons rumor uh, claiming you, s even with the weapons rumors claim, I think that was just a typo, you stole from Skyhold's vault. The odds aren't as important as the consequences, though. I know I can't inspire pity or mercy for Havath and its inhabitants from you, so I won't try, but what can I guarantee? The cycle of revenge will just start anew. Do you think some Havathi orphan won't plot to continue the cycle of vengeance against Starholt, against Sadapsin, against each and every one of your allies? Because I promise you it will, and not out of sheer chance either. Havath is preparing contingencies in the case of its destruction. Kandoran is not the only one to have hoarded city killers. Your allies' homes will not long survive Havath City if it falls. If Havath lives, they're under no threat at all. And we're making sure all your allies' homes know it. And we have a little bit here of Alustin thinking about how this doesn't really sound like her, that likely there were a bunch of people chiming in to like get the tone of this letter exactly how they wanted it. And uh, he's sort of like taken aback at the mention of the Blossom Festival more than once, because it's not exactly a big deal festival. It's kind of a lesser thing. It's like, you know, you would think if somebody were trying to hearken back to nostalgia, they would name things like Christmas, you know, or your birthday or something that was like really a big blowout deal. And instead, it seems like she's going, do you remember like when we used to spend Labor Day at the lake? And uh, he's just like, there's this is mm. I feel like she's trying to tell me something here. Um. He and Valia had attended the Blossom Festival together more years than not, but he honestly couldn't say he had any particularly strong memories attached to it, compared to any one of a dozen the other yearly festivals after all. Maybe Valia had been more involved with the letter than Alessin thought, because it almost sounded like she was inviting him to meet at the ruins of Helico on the day of the Blossom Festival, a date that was just a few weeks before the day Havath City was going to die. Alustin had no question in his mind that it was a trap, but whether it was Valia's trap or her superior's was another question entirely. Alustin smiled, then reached out with his ink magic, and he writes, I'd have liked the, uh, I'd have liked the better world where we walk the streets of Helicote still, Valia. Maybe in that world, Havath wouldn't have to die. Then, just to be sure, Alustin scrawled the same reply across a hundred other copies, 
Just in case, he made sure the epicenter of his responses was located in the jungle southwest of Havath's heartlands. Always useful to send more false trails. And uh, I'm trying to think what it could be that she's attempting to set up here. Because, you know, the whole, like, maybe we could talk this out. I feel like she's past that. I feel like that fight that they just had in the library. I think when she says, I misjudged you and now I see. She's dead serious. Like, he... That was the moment that I think probably most readers also were like, okay, Alustin, hey, bud, why don't you calm it down a little bit? So, you know, I part of me wants to be like, he's going to think it's a trap, but really she is trying to reach out because she cares about him and it, and he's just so paranoid that he can't even comprehend of, of anyone wanting to like get through this and make up. But I don't think so that's the sort of thing that i i feel like that might be the way it would go in a different book but in this i am pretty comfortable with like i don't know if it's a trap to necessarily kill him or if it's a trap that's supposed to like help them figure out what the weapon is and get it off him or maybe just a trap to like hold him in place maybe not kill him but like either distract or disable him temporarily. I don't know, but I feel like it's not, Oh, she really means well. And you are just misunderstanding her. I think that ship has sailed. Um, so uh, let's see. Unless, Oh, right. Unless is talking about the Sarnassans. Uh, there's, it, it's a sort of Sarnassus is playing their cards even closer to the chest than the Tetsian, I think is how you say it. I'm not totally sure. Um, but if they fell in line, just about all the others would too. Tsarnassus had always been the most powerful. Alustin was confident they'd fall in line eventually. Tsarnassans carried a weight of collective guilt for their failure to relieve the siege of Helicote, and they were quite vocal about it. Alustin, the last loyal son of Helicote, could have had fame, wealth, and power, his for the taking, if he'd decided to settle there. Alustin's call to battle was Sarnassus's chance to redeem their failure. And, you know, he... The... The whole thing here of, like, playing on their guilt, it's so... It's so well thought out, you know? I just really have no doubt that will work or would work if things were to go to plan, which I'm going to assume they don't. Um, and I feel like I can't even be that mad about using that guilt. You know, it's like if, if someone used white guilt to scam white people, I'm going to be like, yeah, well, you know, like I'm not going to get mad. Now, granted, this is not a scam. This is like, murder but to a degree i see it i also you guys maybe i'm crazy maybe i'm paranoid with the you know the way that i am all the time you guys have seen it what what are the odds that alustin is the lord of bells is that possible can he be? There's just... I don't know. I don't know. There's just something. Something feeling... Feeling significant. I don't know. And, and I'm not trying to say, like, if he, ha if he isn't, that's a missed opportunity or I'll be disappointed. But I'm just sort of... It's been occurring to me lately. And uh, I don't know if that's, like more satisfying or less if he did turn out to be i enjoy the idea of it being like just some regular dude who winds up just turning a corner but also if it's like the ruler who is the only one who survived other than like two other people i could see that also 
I have to assume he's not because of how Valia remembers him from a child. But I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, this is when he's like thinking about how the battle is going to like turn on them all and that he is just going to say, well, that's what you fucking get. But it says, as the old saying, well, uh, as the old saying went, Dorso kaim strik sav. He blinked. And then it was as if a dam had burst. Alustin staggered, almost crashing into the wall of his tent as the words rushed into his head from the tongue eater. Not just an isolated curse word, like every prior incident, either. Folk sayings, quotes from important speeches, religious mantras rushed through his head one after the other. Words poured through his mind like a flood, driving every other thought out of his mind. Each and every one of them came with flickering images of dead civilizations, of peoples shorn of their languages, cultures, and histories by the tongue-eater across dozens of worlds. None of them lingered in Enlustin's mind, but he was left with vague impressions of blood-red glaciers, skies full of hundreds of moons, lightning-filled seas, and impossible glass cities. Inside his storage tattoo, the tongue-eater shook so violently it threatened to throw itself off the shelf he'd left it on. It felt like minutes had passed, but Alustin hadn't even fallen halfway to the ground before the rushing words came to an abrupt halt. And he's just like, all right, I gotta fucking face reality here. This is getting really, really bad. Like, I was thinking I could hold this off, and if it's attacking me in this way this is a completely different thing. It's not a word or two slipping out. That was an assault, you know? Um, at least he hadn't shown his weakness before anyone else this time. If it had happened during a battle, it probably would have cost him his life. He needed to keep himself together for a few more months. And I'm sorry, bro. This has escalated from one word slipping out to this torrent over the course of like a couple weeks. That's not, you're not making it. You're simply not like, it's just not going to happen. He's just so in such denial and I, it's deeply frustrating to watch that even as this is like clearly pointing toward failure he just is going to do his best to like carry it out anyway. And for fucking what dude, like it's just, it's just foolish. It's just so it's almost childish. You know, there's a sense of such like immaturity to it. And I just want to slap and shake him anyway. Okay. So then we go to chapter 42, the layered sky. And this is when we get like a lot of detail about how the misform labyrinth works. Um, and you know how challenging it is because of it being made of mist and how this is like, it's an interesting combo because it's more dangerous in certain ways. And then there are other things that are easier. So there aren't traps there. They don't come across nearly as many monsters. Um, and it says even the maze aspect was less challenging. There were far fewer branches, fewer dead ends and fewer twists for all that. They were in some ways in far more danger than they would be in a normal labyrinth. Um, Surviving a mist form labyrinth was an exercise of focus and will. The shifting mists around them seemed to invite distraction and lack of focus. They muffled not just sound, but every form of sensory input and made it incredibly easy to drift off into one's own imagination. Doing so would likely be fatal or at best leave them stranded in another world because the mist tunnels shifted. Not fast, a leisurely walking pace was enough to keep ahead of their movement, but you could never stop or rest for long within a misformed labyrinth. Worse, the mists called to you. 
not particularly strongly most of the time, about equal to the urge to eat a pastry sitting on the table. You could resist it easily enough, but doing so ceaselessly was exhausting and required focus and awareness of the sort the labyrinth was intent on denying you. And I really loved that comparison as somebody who has a trouble with like monitoring her eating and making sure that I'm being balanced with things. The comparison to just like something that's sitting there and kind of like on your mind in the back of your head and you are just sort of thinking about it a lot, but you're never actually, I really see that. Um, and it's interesting the way that he describes doing so ceaselessly was exhausting, like resisting it. That is actually a proven fact. There's something in um, in studies that they have done about like willpower and the ways that some folks are able to like manage it seemingly more successfully than others. Basically, the thesis is you start off the day with a bank full of willpower. And as the day goes along, you use it up so that a lot of people save their binge eating for the end of the day because they've used up all their willpower and their brains are tired and they just go ham, pun intended, because they don't have anything left in the tank to hold them back anymore. And that always rang so true to me. There's a, it's like a combination of like, um, they talk about decision fatigue as well as being like almost tied in with it, where if you plan your meals ahead and you know exactly what you're having, because you have less willpower by the end of the day, if you've planned ahead and your salad is just sitting there ready to go, you don't have to think too hard about what you're going to do for dinner and you don't have to make a decision because it's done already and sitting there. And thus having less willpower isn't as much of a problem because there's one option ready and it can be a lot harder to make that good decision if you get home and you have all the ingredients for a salad, but you would have to actually make it and take that extra time and dirty dishes and, you know, all of that. And so the concept of like willpower as being something that's like either stronger or not, depending on who you, not necessarily, like it's just used in different ways, depending on who you are. And if you're somebody who's got a lot going on, if you've got multiple children that you're taking care of, if you've got like somebody elderly that you're caring for, if you yourself are going through health issues and you're, you're starting the day off with less energy than normal, all of these things factor into how much more quickly your willpower will be used up. And I, I think that's a really valuable way of looking at things because we tend to just judge everybody by the same metric as if, if I could do it, you can do it. And if, there's nothing more frustrating than hearing that. Like anytime somebody does, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I just want to punch them. Like literally, what are you fucking talking about? That's such a meaningless phrase. All you're saying is if you can't do what I did, it's because you aren't trying hard enough, which is so not true. Like so many of us are doing nothing but trying all the time and that's what's exhausting. So anyway, I just really liked that comparison. I felt like, you know, that hit hard. Um, so macro was still helpful, but less so than he had been. And again, it's about like, they're not being set paths. The ground they walked on felt like stone, but he felt nothing through its, his affinity senses. And when he tried to brush some of the mist around his feet away, more immediately flowed into its place before he could see beneath it. And I was like, I just, I just want there to be something under his feet. Cause there's like, I have the suspicion that there's just not anything there that they're like walking on the mist and that's all. And they're hovering otherwise like hundreds of feet in the air. And that's super scary to me. No, thank you. Um, Eventually, they come a up against a, like, 90-foot dragon. Uh, after a minute or two of the, uh, after a minute or two of the two sides watching each other cautiously, the dragon slowly gestured to his right. Sabe pointed cautiously past the dragon in the direction they needed to go. Then their group backed down their passage a bit. 
The dragon slowly passed through the intersection, watching them carefully the whole time, peering back at them as it departed down its tunnel. You could have sworn the mist tunnel hadn't been nearly large enough for it before it entered, but soon enough the dragon vanished into the distance. And uh, I just like that because, like, initially when they run into him, I'm like, oh no, a dragon monster they have to fight. And I'm forgetting, like, dragons are mages also. They're just like people, you know, in this universe. Um, so eventually they arrive in Limnus. Uh, and they get their bearings for a little while. It takes a bit as well for the ether sickness to kick in because mist, mist labyrinths are a different breed. Apparently they call, they have like different side effects. Um, they stood atop a tree branch with a flattened top stretching over 50 feet from side to side. Or not really a branch, but Hugh didn't know what else to call it. A bridge, maybe? No leaves or twigs emerged from it. It just stretched for a gently curved half mile between two adjacent tree trunks, the smaller of which was at least a mile in diameter. The larger one behind them had to be at least a league across, and there were thousands of the giant trees in sight. And eventually, when they see leaves, he's, like, disappointed because they are just, like, kind of, you know, slightly bigger than average leaves and not what he was hoping for, which was proportionally large leaves, which, you know, would be, like, a quarter mile across. Um, and the the whole, like, design of this sounds really, really cool. It's hard to picture, you know, being able to even see a half mile like to, that there's a you're still on the same branch by the end of it that's hard to imagine for me and the like clouds below are iodine which in this universe is evidently like just being discovered there's nobody with like an iodine affinity which is really interesting i'm wondering why john beers chose this in particular to be a thing um Iodine was caustic, but it wasn't especially toxic. It could be found in tiny amounts in just about everything, including seaweed and most animals, and it didn't usually alchemically react with other substances in a dangerous way, though exposure to the pure substance could cause alchemical burns. It did have the curious property that its gaseous form was heavier than air, which explained why the purple clouds lurked far below. The scary part of the opaque purple clouds had little to do with iodine's chemical properties. No, the scary part was that iodine was only gaseous at temperatures more than hot enough to set paper ablaze. If any of them fell, it was entirely possible that the caustic purple clouds, crushing pressure, and severe heat below would destroy their armor and kill them before they even struck the ground. As for the vile yellow clouds far above, they were composed of brimstone gases launched high into the sky by the world's countless volcanoes. Unfortunately, brimstone fogs didn't stay up in the sky as well as the purple stayed below. The rains on Limnus were yellow and acidic, and they were strong enough to burn skin or even dissolve it on prolonged exposure. As you ascended the great trees... The temperature dropped rapidly. By the time you reached the yellow clouds, they were low enough that humans unprotected by magic would struggle to survive, even if they could breathe. Galvacrin had a long section in his guide explaining how the world of Limnus worked, which Hugh only somewhat understood. He claimed Limnus' sun was a tiny, cool thing, and that Limnus orbited incredibly close to it, close enough that the gravitational pull should have stopped Limnus's revolutions, leaving one side always facing the sun. Limnus's immense atmosphere, however, had somehow interfered with that process, and the tidal pressures inflicted on the planet not only prevented it from freezing from the lack of heat, but also heated the surface to deadly temperatures that allowed the iodine clouds. Somehow, in the midst of the two lethal gas layers, a band of livable atmosphere had survived. And it turns out, like, as much as this place seems like a complete death trap, there's tons of people living here, which is really neat. You know, this feels like, this feels believable to me. The perseverance 
of humanity to try and survive through anything. Yeah, I buy it. Um, so there's all like kinds of huge monsters. There are layer storms where parts of this like sky that are actually habitable just disappear for a while. Um, there's just so much to worry about here, but they're thriving. So they all have to deal with ether sickness. Um, Hugh set up, sets the Stormward's crown as an impromptu shelter, configuring it primarily as an attention ward and air filter for the group. And because he's doing that, he thinks that that's why it takes him a little bit longer to recover from the ether sickness than it does for everybody else. It took them another half hour of resting before they felt ready to move again. But once they started their walk, they were feeling back to normal in short order. And um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I really do appreciate the concept of ether sickness because, you know, just the idea that you can traipse between universes and you could just jump from one to the other, from one to the other. I mean, that's very easy. So having there be a, like a sort of health related penalty, I like that. I feel like you need to make this a little bit trickier or else it's there there will be moments where it feels like maybe it's a plot hole that we didn't just dodge to another world during this whole thing, you know? Um, so they have, the, there's like a, another labyrinth that's only a couple hours walk away. It was found in the trunk of a particularly massive sky spear close to two leagues in diameter that grew around and through one of the largest mountains they'd ever seen. They could see the tree easily from their current position. It was hard to miss. And I was like, around and through a mountain. Wild. Like, literally cannot picture it. Failing. Um, so, Galvacrin claimed the bridges between sky spears were used to share nutrients between trees and to architecturally stabilize the forest. The guide said sky spear would was among the strongest natural materials in the universe, but that even it struggled to support the colossal sky spears. The bridges were just one of many ways the spears helped keep themselves aloft and bracing the forest against Limnus's storms. So uh, they pass by all kinds of like interesting creatures. I'm not going to get into this too, too much because I'm running out of time. But eventually they run into a person. Um... And there's, it's actually like a group. So let's see, I'm trying to find the spot where they run into them, but I, you know what? I'm just going to say that like, eventually, um, there's a rope that they use to like all connect. It's almost like rock climbing. It reminded me of that concept, you know, that we all like stabilize one another, um, Despite their bulky veils, the stranger launched themselves up the side of the sky spear with unnatural sh speed, often jumping much farther than any of them but Sabé could. Uh, it wasn't more than five minutes before the stranger reached them in a feat of athleticism that no human on Anastas could possibly have replicated without extensive body modification. They didn't even seem to be breathing heavily behind their thick veils. And... Again, they don't speak the language, but they're super friendly and they're like, you know, really attempting to communicate here. And what the impression that I get from this like culture is that they're Italian. Uh, they treat all meals as if they're parties. They're very touchy and, you know, do a lot of gesturing when they talk and their meal times are extremely social and so go on for a long time, like hours. And all of this is just really hitting Italian or Spanish, you could also say, but I really think Italian first. Um, and, you know, these people are like very playful at one point. They are like tugging at the rope between them and they play with mackerel and are like super friendly to mackerel who was not prepared to be embraced quite literally in such like a, a complete way. And uh, it's really kind of adorable that how friendly everybody is here and how uh, even though they're hidden beneath veils and stuff, 
which I could see being like practically helpful due to the gas and the rain and everything. Um, you, so you don't see a lot of people's faces necessarily. Uh, I just think it's fun. It, I kept thinking about the Ewoks a little bit, you know, they live in trees and they're kind of adorable, strangely. Um, but obviously these are not like another species. They're still humans, except later on when we see them, they don't look like they're human. So, uh, they finally, we get to one of the bromeliad villages as they walked out along the branch toward the bromeliad village, they got their first close look at sky spear leaves. And this is when they're like normal and Hugh is bummed out. Um, the bromeliads are, you know, all kinds of different colors and, uh, they have to, it says the largest had to be at least 300 feet in diameter, spanning well over three fourths of the top of the branch built in and among the massive flowers were bark pathways filled with foot traffic. They were sewn together with rope rather than being nailed together, which makes sense. If you're dealing with like winds and stuff, you want things to be as flexible as they can be. Um, and they're, yeah, they're, everybody's covered in veils or some folks have masks, but he can't quite tell why some do and others don't. Uh, and eventually they find out this village is named Chelder. Um, they pass through an area. I really love this, that they are in the village and Hugh is like looking for a marketplace, but this place doesn't seem to function with capitalism, which is ideal. Instead, there were quite a few storehouses for various goods that anyone seemed free to take from or add to at will. There were also a few open-sided gazebo structures woven from heavy bark strips where people cooked and served meals. The open sides weren't entirely open. They liked the open doors and windows and the people had mostly translucent veils over them. So Kunin brings them into a dining hall and they wind up once again, like really enjoying the food. It's not familiar, but they are able to tolerate most of it. And it seems like the people at the table are aware what is likely going to be unsafe for them. So Hugh like reaches for a sauce at one point that they pull out of his reach and look alarmed by. So apparently what we find out here is that the magic on this world causes your brain or your brain, your body to change and adapt. And this turns a lot of the folks here into really strange looking beings. Some of them have gills. Some of them have like really smooth skin, like a salamander um, or, you know, fins or they like are completely hairless all kinds of, of different looks. And, uh, the, I'm assuming the food that they pull out of his reach is stuff that you can only tolerate if you have undergone a lot of these changes. So this is why Hugh and his friends are here is to gather the magic from this place and use it to enhance themselves. And they aren't going to be there long enough to transform like these people have because that takes years, but they're going to help them be a little bit better at everything. They'll be, they'll have a more robust immune system. They'll be able to go without breath for slightly longer. They will be like, have more um, dense bones and stronger tendons. Like, Everything about the function of their bodies is just going to be improved a, a bit, which collectively can easily be enough to take it over the top and let you win a battle against somebody else who should have beaten you. And I think that's cool. I like this idea a lot. Um, so yeah, the, this is when we find out like how touchy they are. And uh, Hugh notices that even though they don't really respect boundaries in that they don't, they don't avoid touching anybody specifically, it seems like they are able to sense that Talia and Godric are the ones that are going to be more receptive. And so they are, they back off on Hugh and Sabe, which I appreciate them having that sense. Um, and Mackerel is like delighted. He's playing around with everybody. 
and let's see. Um, Kunin and a friend of hers, Otkin, tried to offer Hugh and his friends one of the bark houses woven into the bromeliads, but they did their best to decline politely via pantomime. Instead, they set off down the tree branch toward the mountain. So they are looking around for a place to set up shop. Um, they set about carving a lost home into the side of the mountain, just like the countless thousands scattered across Skyreach Range. This quickly caught the attention of Kunin and Otkin, but they seemed more interested than surprised. Hugh was beginning to suspect that otherworldly magic was a more common sight in Shelter than he'd anticipated. It took a few hours to get the house set up. The ether of Limnus was a little thinner than they were used to, but most of the delay came from arguing about the specific design, where their training hall should be, how many windows they should have, that sort of thing. As the four of them worked and argued cheerfully, Hugh couldn't help but have his gaze drawn back to the impossibly huge forest in every direction. He found it hard to believe it was only a few days ago that they'd left their own world. And, uh, yeah, I, I love this. Any time that you've got like a, you know, a cast of friends and they are, they start things off like kind of being disparate and then they reach a point where they are sharing a living space. I am always so into it. Like, I just really, that can turn into such a fun thing. And also I hope that we get to hear exactly what they do with the design and how it turns out. So, um, all right, I'm going to have to wrap up. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Sorry about the problems with the reception on Crowdcast. You know, can't help it. But appreciate your patience. And I will be seeing you all again tomorrow because I'm taking the rest of the week off from Wednesday on because Rashawn is coming to go to Beyonce. So see you here same time tomorrow. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.